My name is Martin Smoker and I uh, direct the Latin American program for the Institute over the last 15 years or 70 years, whatever. And uh, today we have a great pleasure to have an old friend, an old collaborator, and a very nice guy, very good person. Antonio Suela produced a book in uh, 18, 1989. Sorry, <laughs> 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 not that old. <laughs> That is a major reference in Latin America on, on legal issues and property rights, and um, it's kind of a, a must, re uh, must reading for anyone um, dealing with the issues of informality in Latin America. And, um, and um, this is it's called the uh, city, private property, and, and the law. He, he has been involved in these issues for quite a bit of time, he's, although he's not that old. Uh, in 2006, bearing on his experience as a general attorney for the um, environmental and Mexican federal government, he provided a sociological reconstruction of that experience in, in a book called Visionaries and Pragmaticians, a Sociological Approach to Environmental Law. This was published in 2006. Then, before embarking on his current project, uh, the object of this lecture on judges and cities, and um, he coordinated for the Institute a number of, of initiatives, seminars, workshops, and so forth, here to raise awareness of public officials on this rather torturous issues of public land acquisitions. This is a very hot topic in Latin America, and, uh, and so to speak, the playground for corruption of politicians and all that. Uh, this book on expropriation in Latin, in Latin America is co-edited with the uh, UNAM, the university uh, where he uh, is affiliated still, and the National University of Columbia. Uh, and it's, uh, um, the title is Taken, Taken for the City, Disputed Public Interest for, in Five Latin American Metropolis. So he has been looking to the, um, how different, in different places in Latin America land is acquired and what are the um, what are the conditions under, under which expropriations are being conducted. And today he will be talking about his new research topic, Judicial Activism in Latin America has finally reached its urban issues. As in many countries, judges are becoming critical actors in conflicts of land use, environmental concerns, housing rights, and, and all that. Uh, many countries have passed, in, recently in Latin America, have passed important urban development laws at the national level addressing many critical issues of associated with urbanization, like the so-called social function of urban property, uh, the redistribution of land value increments resulting from public actions, so-called the value capture stuff. This, there's a lot of, of, of new legislation coming out on that, under that heading. Environmental constraints regarding land uses, alternative forms of regularizing formal occupations and the like. This is, these are all very a lot of you know, legal innovations in this area that's being promoted uh, uh, through these uh, new legislations. And all that adding significant issues to, the, to be dealt by the courts. And with that, the need to legal apparatus to more than take notice, be prepared to deal with these issues. We, in fact, have been uh, approached by many uh, entities in Latin America that um, representatives of uh, public attorneys entities to provide training on the fundamentals of land markets and associated fiscal and regulatory issues. This is becoming an issue that they're finding out that they have to deal with and they're not prepared for that. And um, so they're looking for training. The lecture uh, will show that while in some cases judicial intervention contributes to good urban governance, in many cases it has counterproductive effects without putting into question the need to strengthen the rule of law in urban life, it is suggested that the role of judges in urban conflicts should be regarded as a serious subject of inquiry from a social science perspective. Well, Antonio has a long CV, I'm not gonna expose on that, but he, he has a law degree from the University of Ibero-American in Mexico. He has a master's of law from Warwick University in Great Britain and a PhD from, from Mexico's National University. Since the last 70s, since the, sorry, since the late 70s, he has been engaged in research and teaching in urban environmental law from a social legal perspective. Um, he is a member of the Social Research Institute at the UNAM, 
and has been member of the board from 2000 to 2007. And above all, he is an accomplished chamber music pianist. So, <laughs> so with a, we are honored to have you here today. So please, uh, you have the, about an hour to. Thank you very much, Martin, and I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I'm very grateful uh, to the Institute for um, the support they, uh, they have been giving me in, in, in the last years and um, for the warmth uh, and the, the, uh, the way they're you know, treating me now that I'm here for a couple of months. It's very exciting to, to, to be here and I'm, and I'm, I'm very happy to, to have the opportunity of sharing with you some thoughts about a, a project that's just beginning. Um, it has to do with understanding judicial activism in, in Latin America. Before I, I, I start up, I, I would say that there are great expectations throughout Latin America about the rule of law. After authoritarian regimes gave way to mostly democratic regimes in the 90s, uh, one of the big issues for us was what about the law? What about the rule of law? And there, are, there are great, great expectations about this. And my, uh, what I'm going to talk about is how urban research can contribute to the understanding of what's happening. Because there, are, courts are being empowered. Uh, many discussions are centering on what, how courts are dealing with conflicts and I think we have to be <coughs> very cautious about what's happening there. And the, the main uh, uh, question in my, in, in my presentation would be uh, that we have to look attentively at what is it exactly that's happening, what uh, kind of social effects it, it, it may have. So my idea today is to give you some landmark cases, some important cases that uh, must uh, be used as red lights, as uh, indications of what sort of things are, are we seeing. Then I'll take a, a quick glance to the state of the art and the literature because we have to op open your, our, our minds to different disciplines and different approaches to, to how uh, courts are studied throughout uh, the social sciences. Then I indulge in some speculations about what are the real impacts of what's happening in Latin American cities, and then back to the, the, the need of building solid ground to do research uh, to, that produces usable and uh, important knowledge. And I will end up uh, by reflecting about the contrast between what is at stake in urban conflict and how the law deals with it. And I think this is going to be the clue of uh, what I'm going to be doing. In, in the following years. So this is a combination of findings, of, of things that we know for certain that are happening in Latin America and reflections on how to embark on a, on a more ambitious research project <coughs> in the region. And I must say that, that in last uh, July, uh, the Lincoln supported a meeting we had in Buenos Aires in which we created a network of researchers, in which we had uh, four countries with a dozen of researchers committed to think together about all these issues. These issues. Well, let's begin with the Matanza Rechuelo. Um, this is one of the, the largest rivers that crosses throughout Buenos Aires, a highly polluted river. Probably this is the worst river pollution in the continent. And that, that had, had been waiting for years to, for action to be, to be done until the Supreme Court in 2006 ordered the government to do something and appointed a judge to follow the actions of, of the government. Um, you have like 17,000 people who would have to be removed from, from the, the river banks and, and the very complex and huge environmental problems. The thing is, uh, the Supreme Court uh, makes this decision and empowers a judge to follow what government is doing. A judge, a judge that became actually like a governor of the whole basin of the area. He conducts 
uh, he directs government to do this or that. And there are two secretaries of the environment at uh, the city of Buenos Aires who have already resigned because they are, they are not following the indication of, of the judge. The people wonder about that. To, to what extent the judge should, should be acting as governor of, a, of an area. The second case is Quito. The authorities, the planning authorities, decide that this is, can be a, a nice area for, for a metropolitan park. This had never been uh, urbanized. They put this in the, in the master plan as a metropolitan uh, park. They expropriate the park. And the owners challenge this decision. They litigate for eight, nine years until they reach uh, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights that condemns the Equatorial government for failing to uh, give justice in, 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 this, in this matter. When it was the owner that was challenging all the time because, because the owners want a very high compensation uh, considering that they, they would be able to build a high income uh, with, with certain neighborhood with a nice view. And the government kept saying, but, but this was never an urban land. You deserve compensation for a rural land, and you're demanding for, for, for urban land. Well, uh, the court did not what to do. And they, they just averaged the, the, what the, the owners want of what the city government wanted to pay. Well, let's say the, they, they wanted 80, 80 million dollars. Government said the land was worth six million dollars. Yeah. The, the court awarded 25 million dollars. And of course, some of the judges who in, are in the minority wrote dissents saying, listen, we're crazy. We're, we don't, we don't even know what we're doing. We don't even understand how to reach the, a sensible figure. Uh, and the, the, the bottom line is, is one of the justices says, this is the highest compensation that we as a court have awarded in our history for a violation of human rights. So a court that was created to deal with the crimes of dictatorships ends up awarding uh, the, its highest compensation for a landowner who wanted to, to capture uh, the rents that he never produced. But this is a red light. That at the highest level of our constitutional inter-American system, the court does, just do, doesn't know what what's, uh, what they're doing. This is a uh, concern. Well, the good news is Bogota. Uh, uh, this is a very good example of how the, the high courts in, in, in Colombia are dealing in a very uh, intelligent way with uh, urban conflicts. The Transmillennium is the, the system of transport that has gained a lot of legitimacy as one way of regaining public space in the city. It has a lot of <coughs> great social support, but its building uh, means expropriating uh, land uh, from poor people in, in poor neighborhoods and expelling people. So the court did recognize that it was not the same thing being a landowner who doesn't use the land than being a person who, who owns a house where, where they live. So they are making these nuances, they're making these distinctions, and they're really understanding what <coughs> urban differences are about. So this is, this is some good news. There are out there some life courts that, are, that know what are doing. At the other extreme, we have a very important case in Mexico City, which is called El Encino. Uh, a plot of land which is located in the, in the western part of Mexico, what they call the, the global Mexico City, Santa Fe, that has developed in the last 20 years as, as the most affluent area. Um, and there was this piece of land, sorry about that, about 15 acres, that was in the way of the main road system of the area. You, you can see this is the main road, it goes this way, and it's a, like a circuit. 
here it's the, the, the most important hospital, private hospital in the in that zone of the city. There are other developments, and this was a private land. The government expropriated this piece and this piece, like taking like ten percent of the plot away from the owner in order to, to complete the, the street. It was it was as, as obvious uh, uh, as, as this. But the owner challenged this in court. The federal judge finds that there's no justification for such an expropriation, grants an injunction. There are allegations that, that uh, the government didn't obey the, the judge immediately. And this escalated into a conflict that led to the impeachment of the uh, city mayor. This was the first big constitutional conflict in modern democratic Mexico, where people from different parties were using a legal case to attack each other. The man who was impeached, and this involved the whole uh, House of Representatives, the President of the Republic. This was just because it was supposed to, to he, he had supposed to not uh, obey the, the court, the judge's in, injunction. Then in 2011, the, the Supreme Court had a dilemma. Um, would the road, should the road be opened and pay a compensation to the owner who had won the suit but the road was already there, or giving the, the, the land back to the owner and forget about the work that was already built. I was uh, lucky enough to, to be invited by the court to make the expert study to balance to what were the social benefits and the, and the, and the individual benefits of both parties to, to see whether it was a, a good idea to have the roads open. Of course, I was very embarrassed because it was obvious that the, the road was already built and it was, it was absolutely necessary. It was blocking the entrance to a huge hospital and 28,000 people were being prevented from using that, that road. But I wrote this uh, survey, they, they, they accepted this, but with a very close difference. They voted six uh, in favor, five against. Wow. And one of the, the interesting things uh, in, in the discussion was how justices read urban space. How do they think about the city? For example, one of the justices uh, said, well, the, 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 the street is really not there, is it? It's in the file of the discussion. She couldn't find the, the fact that the, the street was already built. Well, you can see here there's some plants, and because it's after eight years that the, the place was abandoned because of the legal suit. But then one of the justices just cannot see the street. But more interestingly, the, another one, reacting to um, one of the arguments of our study that said that the, the landowner would capture a, a huge uh, increase in, of his land. Any, in any situation, our argument was whether you build a street or not, he will benefit by 300 times in, 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 in 10 years. The, the, the land, the, the, it was a land increase. And then in the, in the plenary session, one of the justices says, but what produced this increase in value? It was the fact that the city surrounded this plot. Now, who should obtain this increase? The owner or someone else? Is this increase the merit of some public authority? Absolutely no. The city simply surrounded it. Well, it is like, the city is like some sort of natural event like rain, like manna, <laughs> that was brought into, into the, this man's land. I mean, the, the minister cannot see streets, urban order, everything that comes with uh, the city that surrounds a flood. And I think this is the, the I'm worried because no one challenged, challenged this in the debate. So that's kind of bad news. Now, we, we go far from landmark cases. There's a, there's a very interesting research that was funded by the, by the Institute about Sao Paulo public defenders. So this public 
interest litigation that now exists in, in, in Brazil. Just to give you an idea of how important this is, at, 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 the, at, the, lowest, at the lower level of the judiciary, the judicial system, uh, only in 2009, two, more than 2,500 cases uh, of class actions were uh, pushed by these public defenders in Sao Paulo. So you were looking at uh, large activities in the lower end and some funny things at the, at the upper end. So the obvious, um, the obvious remark is legal practice is a huge universe, a very complex world. How to approach it? Uh, let me give a glance on the literature. But the first thing you have to, to see is well, what can you learn from different social disciplines? And I'm going to give a brief comments on four areas, which are traditional legal analysis, social legal studies, ethnographic approaches, and political science. What do we learn from this? Because we, we could talk about hours about the, the literature. It's, uh, I have been able to read only a tiny part of it, each, um, but um, uh, this is going to be oversimplified, but I think we have to have an idea of what the landscape of ideas are around us. And traditional legal analysis is important because they, they give you the law as it is. Of course, this is, it's always debatable whether there's something which is out there that exists as, as a thing, uh, the law. Um, and uh, most legal scholars would, would, would claim that the law is, once you know what the law is, its implications are clear. You know who wins, who loses. Well, this is problematic from the social science perspective, but you still have to take uh, legal scholars and, and lawyers seriously. This is a source that uh, is unavoidable because at some point you're going to have a point of view of <laughs> what the law uh, at least should be. Now you have the social legal studies, which is a, a universe in which you have uh, um, the only common uh, idea of, of this huge universe is uh, anti-formalism. Uh, the idea that law is a social construction, it's always uh, changing, it's always subject to, to debate, and it, it's a very rich source of uh, reflection, but, but there are too many theories circulating around. If you look at the law and society literature, it, it, you, you, don't, you don't know who uh, which are the main theories that you have to uh, deal with? Anyway, it's, it's, it's an important field. Then you, you have ethnography, mainly anthropological approaches, but um, people who go into the culture, courtroom and look, well, how is it? How does it work? And, and there's a very interesting paper with James Holson, uh, an American anthropologist, that in the, in the early 90s was trying to see how the new legislation that Martin was talking about um, was being uh, mobilized in, in courts. And he reached a, an outrageous conclusion. The, the, law, the legal system is built in order to produce conflict, not to solve it. Something difficult to accept, but he was looking at how people used court delays to have advantages. So those who have power would manipulate what happens in court. This is simplification, but uh, the interesting thing about, I think about this paper is that we urban lawyers are not discussing this, are not taking seriously this kind of literature. It's like it doesn't exist. And in fact, the ethnographic uh, analysis of, of the law uh, are, are being more and more important. Uh, there is always a French uh, author uh, in, uh, in the uh, fashion. Uh, nowadays it's Bruno Latour, the one of the sociologist that's trying to refound sociology. And one of the, his major works is a book called The Making of the Law. How is it that decisions are reached in a specific context? Looking at what, what, what happens in the court, in this painful reconstruction of of uh, legal proceedings. Then you have political science, 
is the strongest of all these fields because they share very few basic questions. Like, if courts are having more power, why is that? Why would the elites, the ruling elites of a country, would allow courts to have more power? Isn't that dangerous for them? Or when courts become very active, why would they do that? So they have a, some basic scientific questions that are trying to answer through models and with a vast uh, universe of information that you can have in this country, for example. But they are very, doing very important work in, um, in Latin America. Most of the work about courts in Latin America comes from politi political science. It's like Latin American young coming to the United States to study, doing a PhD on why Brazil or Colombia or Mexico would have this you know, things. So it's a very important literature um, that uh, poses these basic questions about why and how courts are beginning to be so powerful. The problem is that they don't look at the specific issues at hand. They are looking at courts within the state system, uh, relationship to the media, but they don't actually look at the concrete uh, conflicts. And this is where I think urban research can contribute. Because urban sociologies, urban studies in general, do have a sense of what's at stake. So my, my feeling is that we can start filling the gap. And there are works that are I think, in, in, in that direction. The, the, the work I, I already mentioned by Salo Kozlowski in, in Brazilian courts, uh, a lot of work on the Matanza y uh, ruling that I mentioned at, at, at the beginning. That it's a, a very serious question, which is, okay, we have environmental rights protected by a strong judicial ruling, but we have housing rights. If we have to evict, if the judge says that 17,000 people, pe uh, uh, persons ha have to be removed from where they live. We have a housing rights question. And there have been some uh, evictions without any compensation, without any uh, alternative to people who live there. So this literature are giving us the, 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 like the facts, the conditions under which this is dilemma is happening. Because when, when you look at uh, from the optimistic, legal, progressive point of view about rights, most uh, legal scholars will tell you that human rights are going to be the guidance for the courts in the future. And they don't realize that sometimes human rights cl clash. Uh, the, the, there are conflicts uh, between each other. And housing rights versus environmental rights is a very serious thing throughout Latin America, and in particular in this case. In the case of Colombian high courts, we are having, thanks to, to this literature, a very clear idea of how you see, the judges are dealing with this kind of conflicts. And other work that uh, a group of people have been doing on expropriations also gives us, I think, um, an idea of how are things being dealt with. So, what's our research strategy? I think we have to, to go from what we know about judicial activism to indulge in some speculation about its social impact and, and then back to solid ground to, to build new knowledge. Now let's begin to tell you black and white what's happening in Mexico uh, in, in particular. What I, what I can see now is that four things are clearly happening in, in, in the Mexican judicial system. The third generation of rights, housing, environmental, all kind of rights are dominating the scene within uh, courts in, in Mexico. But we also have new players because the rules on standing, the, I mean, the possibility of a person to uh, ask for a remedy, to mobilize a court, have been opened. In, 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 many, uh, in many countries, particularly in Mexico, uh, NGOs, people who, who don't have a direct uh, interest but can be said to represent a wider interest. Citizens can challenge decisions and are becoming new 
players in the, in the legal field. Also, and this is not new, this is as old as property, the property rights are being contested. So the, the, the courtroom is a place where the extension of property rights is being defined. And there is also a relation between government branches or levels. Uh, this is what they, we call unconstitutional litigation in, in Mexico. The Supreme Court is now the arbiter for conflicts uh, between legal levels of government or branches of, of the government. What would be the, the social impacts of these developments? And this is where we begin speculating. There, there are some very clear things. Uh, the more conflicts between branches of government are taken to the court, the court begins and it becomes more powerful. Nowadays, many of the conflicts that in the old days were solved politically through different uh, proceedings, now it's, it's the court that's having the power to decide when it's Congress, when it's a governor against uh, the federal government, when it's a local government against the governor. With the stronger property rights, we have two basic social impacts. Weaker, uh, a weakening of the planning instruments in general, and the changing power relations. When you have a, a person who gets a judicial injunction to declare null and void the land use, and he's uh, able to build just whatever he wants. And there are in Mexico City some rulings in which the judge orders the planning authority to just give the owner the permit for whatever he wants to build, believe it or, believe it or not. Uh, you're changing power relations within in this particular urban context. When you adjudicate based on, on right discourse, probably the, the wider social impact is that you you would see greater legitimacy, legitimacy of uh, certain social demands. If housing rights are upheld by the Supreme Court, presumably you, you would have this wider social impact in terms of legitimacy. And with new actors in the legal field, presumably you would have growing uh, expectations about social participation in our government. But these are speculations. We don't know for sure. Where I put the question marks is where I'm not so sure. Of course, when you talk about stronger property rights, you can be sure of a couple of things. Because we, we've tested this. You have higher compensations to pay in expropriation cases. You have land regulations that become inapplicable. The protection of property rights depends, the, the social effect of, of, of property rights depends on who are the owners. And in Mexico, one half of the national territory is owned by peasant communities, our famous ejidos. So strengthening property rights means strengthening peasants' power vis-a-vis -vis the state. So the kind of legitimacy that this means is very different if we are talking about private corporations or family, rich families. So it doesn't mean the same. You're, in Mexico, you're having great social support for peasants' ownership. Even, even if they abuse of their property rights, they, they will have a lot of sympathy around them to the media. And that's a complicated cultural thing about Mexican that you have to do, deal with. There are other outcomes from what's happening in courts. One, a classical thing, is delay. The courts sometimes don't reach the final uh, uh, solution that is clearly explained. Courts sometimes just make decisions that make delay things. Yeah. And procedural arguments. Sometimes courts don't give strong substantive arguments of what they're doing. They use, use procedural arguments to, to go on. And these two aspects have impact. Delay is a classic question in, 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 in the judiciary and on the legal and the literature and courts. But winning time is isn't isn't it a form of winning already? They say that provisional solutions become permanent. Well, um, this 
may work in, in, in many ways. The, for example, nowadays in Mexico City, there's a big project, Supervia Poniente, which is the first private toll um, highway throughout the city that connects the west to the south, 25 kilometers. It was challenged by a group of neighbors. They obtained uh, a ruling from a judge saying that the, the permit for this court was null, it was annulling it, but then the government appealed to a higher court that declared an, an injunction and the, the, the roads being built. So when, when the, the trial finally ends, we will, we will have a fait accompli. The, the, the work, the, I'm sure that the, the road will work, but not always works like this. There's a famous metal clad case. In this case, Mexico as a, as a state was, was the first fan, was challenged, was sued by a, uh, an American corporation on the NAFTA, the famous chapter 11 of the North American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, the first time that the American corporation challenged the Mexican decision, um, it was a, about a project that was stopped by the judicial injunction. And Mexico lost $17 million with that case. It was the sitting of a, of a, a hazardous waste uh, facility in northern Mexico. And I, I, was, I had the bad luck to, to be involved in this, in this case, and it's a very complicated case. But it, it, it's, it's interesting that the reason why the arbitration panel in Washington decided that Mexico was expropriating uh, this corporation was because there was an injunction from a federal judge stopping the, the project. So we have clear impacts in individual cases, but that doesn't give, you, give us an idea of general trends. So, and the same with procedure versus, uh, versus substance. This, this, uh, proceduralization is one of the big issues in, in court, in this literature. And, and it's not clear what are the, the social effects. So we have too many speculations, uh, and that's why I think we have to develop a research strategy to begin building solid ground. And, and I think we have three areas that we have to cover. First, we have to, to have an idea of the institutional landscape. What, what are the general trends of, or, uh, of what courts are actually doing? We, we need a landscape of what the, the our conflict is, and and this is what I'm more interested. In. We have to look at the way legal processes transform, redefine, reshape conflict. But the first uh, landscape, we would have to to cover it, uh, and this is what we are trying to do for for the Mexican case. We need quantitative analysis of relevant decisions. We, we have some collections of relevant decisions, but we don't have a clear, simple explanation of what do they mean. So what, we need like databases on basic on, on decisions. We don't have that. Then we have in-depth, contextualized analysis of some landmark decisions to see what was the intricacies of, of uh, a, a case. And again, we need quantitative analysis of lower courts outcomes, because most people are looking at what high courts are doing, because it's so spectacular, it's in the papers, there are so many expectations, and everyone wants want to, to do amico curiae and argue with the justices, but nobody's looking at what the lower courts are doing. And then we have to look at public interest litigation, which is a, a new area in, in, in Latin America. This is, the, the, I think, the way in which we can see trends on what are actually doing, what's actually happening in, in courts. Then we need to have a landscape of, of urban conflict. I mean, not every city has the same of level of urban conflict in all, in, in, in the same um, aspects. We need to study relevant cases, but we also need to, to have more general information. And, and let's see if this works. Oh. This is, this is a, 
a project that I've been working for, uh, in, in, in many, for many years. I'm not going to spend time uh, uh, showing you the, all, all the details. It's uh, Observatorio de Instituciones Territoriales. It's an observatory of territorial institutions. And we are uh, building this, if I can, <coughs> database on complaints <coughs> presented to the, to the Mac, uh, capital's ombudsman, the Procuraduría de Ordenamiento Territorial. So we have 500 complaints filed uh, to, the, to the government. With a, with a very fine classification of every every single complaint. So what is it that ordinary people are complaining about? So this is like a picture of, of the urban conflict as it <coughs> appears in Mexico City. If you don't understand what what conflicts are happening in your city, you you, you lose sight of the meaning of what courts are doing. About. General idea of urban conflict has to be translated into which conflicts go into the legal system. And I uh, arrived to a classification of three drivers that make people that uh, go to the court. First, people who protect the quality of their urban space, it can be land, locally unwanted land uses, or people who want to, to, to express themselves about a project that doesn't necessarily affect them. <coughs> then you have people who want to protect their property rights. They go to court because they feel they're threatened in their property rights. That would be taking, uh, planning, uh, whatever. And you would have um, state organs protecting their share of power. That would be like the three drivers. And we are having, getting a, an idea of what kind of um, conflicts enter the, the court system and what the court system is doing. The general impression that one gets uh, is that about if, 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 I, if I have to, to give a general image of what's happening, I would say that what's happening is very high, is highly significant within the legal world. Lawyers are excited, judges are excited, a lot of things are happening within the legal world, but what about outside the legal world? I think there are very small changes in urban governance, except for these cases like the Matanza Riachuelo. If you look at the city's business as usual, great <coughs> excitement within, within the legal field doesn't mean general impact in the urban scene, except as in trains lately, some delays. You're going to help. You're going to help. You'll have delays for many things. Uh, this is what courts are doing. But, so that's an impression um, on the uh, landscape of conflicts and the landscape of uh, what's happening in courts. Now, the third aspect and the, the thing which I'm more interested in looking at is the process of. What, how is it that what is at stake in a conflict is transformed uh, in, in, in the court form? What are the conditions that produce these outcomes? And we know that uh, when, a, when we go to the courtroom, the, the language changes. There's, first of all, a change in language. But there's a whole transformation of the conflict. And I, I, I love to quote. Uh, it was Bismarck, I think, who said that the, the person who, who learns how laws are made are very, have the same experience as the person who knows how sausages are made. You don't want to eat sausages once you see how they're cooked. Um, I think you can, you can take this to the, to, the, to the courtroom, but it might make you sick. But for me, the most important is that it makes you curious of how is it done? How is this process of putting a conflict in, in the court and how is, is it transformed? And I'm going to give you just one example from the research I'm doing uh, about 
conflicts after the, the, the earthquake in Mexico City in 1985, in which uh, the government expropriated 5,000 properties in order to, to develop a housing program in the center of Mexico City. Um, almost 500, or 10 percent of those properties, where the owners challenged the decision to the court. They went to court and they won. So the government had to give the properties back to the owners. But the problem is that the new houses were already built. So the government had to pay from four to five times the original compensation to these owners who were lucky enough to go to the court. OK. What is this? This is a distortion of, if you want, of the conflict or distortion to the law. The legal argument is that those expropriations were unconstitutional because they were not justified. That was the, what, what the judges uh, say. This is unconstitutional. So the logical consequence is to prevent the expropriation. No, but the practical consequence was the people got more money. So this is a, this is a distortion. The logic of the law is not, has nothing to do with the outcome of the, of, of the court's activity. Everybody knew this, everybody can live with this, but that's, that's a fact. The, the, the legal practice is distorting either the law or the, or the conflict. And, and this is only one example, I could give you many more, but I, I think this is a good example of how the way the system works produces reshaping, reconfiguration, transformation of the conflicts that originally goes in. So this is, for me, uh, the, the correct question. How is it that conflicts are reshaped? How is it that delay is produced? And, the, and what distributive effects does it have? And how is it that distortion produces whatever effects it, it can have? So, I have only two, two more slides to, to sum up. What do we know? About the legal field in cities in, in, in Latin America, we know that there are new social actors, that new discourses are being mobilized within the system. Uh, we know that there are delays, and that it sounds like a, a simple thing, but it has important effects. And we have distortion, and that's what we want to study. Um, and we have contested property rights, uh, as always. But about the implication of this phenomenon in, in urban life, we, we still have too many question marks. And this is what, uh, do, do we have changes in urban governance? Um, we have speculations. And, and it's good that we indulge in speculations, but we're not sure about this, this impact. So what should we explore? Um, I think that within legal procedures, we must make sure that we understand how delay, distortion, and relevant decisions are produced within the process. And outside the process, I think we have to, to, to have a clear idea of the broader landscape uh, in the court system and um, in the outer world. So how is it that the, that the conflict is being dealt with uh, at all levels, both of conflict and of court. And this is what I wanted to share uh, with you today. Thank you very much. One of the, uh, the important things that we, uh, we have to, uh, I forgot to mention, is that uh, this kind of research is a kind of exploit, exploration whether we should, what is there for us to, uh, to pursue and whether there is something there that would justify perhaps a, a broader, bigger program of, of, um, sort of in, inviting a, and trying to uh, seduce people to, to work more carefully into these issues because they are so, so, so important and, and, and the, the level of ignorance on, in this area in Latin America among public officials, uh, particularly land planners or urban planners, is, is, uh, is, is astonishing. This lecture certainly has piqued my curiosity, and this is a pretty general question, but can you characterize any differences in judicial activism through Latin America? Like, is, is there more of it in, in 
Mexico? Are there some countries that are lagging behind? I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah. sure. But first, let, let me say I forgot. I was so, so busy with the timer that I, I, I forgot. Uh, you did time. very well. Yeah. You did in less than 45 minutes. For Mexican, this is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I, I forgot uh, expressing, my, my, uh, expressing my, my thanks to, to Martin Smolka, who has been supporting this, this research uh, all, 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 all this year. I'm sorry for not mentioning that. Um, but yes, there are, there are many differences. And. You have on the on the one hand you have countries in which um, the the judicial elite, so to speak, or the legal elite, has been part of constitutional change, as in Colombia. That's my hypothesis of why the the high courts in in Colombia are so sensitive to these issues, and they are part of the process. Many of the justices of, of the ha of the uh, um, Corte Constitucional were uh, drafting a part of the drafting of the constitution, so they feel that they are like part of it. And in other countries, the, the judiciary didn't take a part of it. It was just a question of politicians, and then judges as a corporation feel like threatened and tend to maintain the old ways. So that would be m m one way of establishing uh, differences. Um, but there's a, uh, beyond differences from one country to another, I would say that the, the, there is a Latin American wave. There's a common language that they, we call garantismo. There's a, as a way of neo-constitutionalism, as a way of characterizing a new way of looking at the law in which rights are on, at the center of legal practice. Most judges you used to see their job as applying the law. They were legalistic and formalistic. And nowadays, garantismo means they are expected to rule from uh, the idea of human rights or fundamental rights. And that's like a common trend with it throughout Latin America. That's why I think it's worth looking at the differences because there's so much common ground. Yeah, it, it, it seems to me that there's a sort of general practice when judges get into areas where they don't have particular expertise, which might happen, for example, in a patent case where the judge has to understand something about organic chemistry or you know whatever it happens to be or whether this is a discovery or it's an invention and so on and so forth uh, and and there's a practice of bringing in expert witnesses now you you had suggested that you had you you had might have been an expert witness but you had participated as a, as an expert is is that uh, a, a sort of path? Is that part of the problem or is that part of the solution in this case? Because I mean, I know of cases uh, where judges have made kind of completely crazy valuations of property, for example, uh, often much too high, not much too low. And uh, it, it almost se seems as if they're not drawing on, uh, on, on the state of the art. And, and, and is that, is that something that you're optimistic about or pessimistic about in this case? Is, or, or is this situation different in some sense? Mm. Uh, but but what, what about this whole business of, of, of bringing in expert witnesses or to try and inform the judge about what to do? I think that's, that's crucial. That's what I want to, to focus my own research on the way they elaborate things. Uh, the, 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 the Institute supported a, a workshop with judges earlier this, this year and they were interested, they, they, they came, we had like 25 judges, but the, the main reaction to the invitation was, yeah, you're going to have a course, okay, I want to, sp to speak in the course. <laughs> the attitude was not, I want to learn, but I want to lecture upon you, okay. So we have to, to look for this combination. and. I think we have to. Uh, I want to be optimistic. I ought to be optimistic in order to organize uh, things. 
and I see there are very strong resistances, but that's one of the, the areas in which we can, I think, do, do the progress. Because I, I think that cultural change exists, and that's, that's possible to, to, to move this along, but that is one of the key areas, for sure. We had at some point, as a visiting fellow, as, as he is uh, this time now, uh, Sonia Habelo was a lawyer here, and she was studying the, uh, the difference between the, the courts in the U.S. and in Latin America in general. And she was astonished with this, the difference, how technical information is considered within the courts and how they rely on here and there. I think, well, here there is a room for any, any judge, apparently, when they, they have to, to uh, um, speak about something, they would bring in some technical uh, um, uh, help on that. In Latin America, it's very, it's very difficult, very hard to find that. This doesn't happen. They don't simply, they think that they, they can do without that, and there is no legal status, right, for, for, these, uh, for these technical, it's only recently that it's becoming, uh, the, some of these technical issues are becoming uh, uh, more part of the day-to-day uh, -day, uh, um, court procedure, right? I don't know if you want to. Right. Um, well, I, I don't know about other countries. In, yeah. in Mexico, we have a tradition of peritaje. A perito is yeah, the perito, yeah, it, perito like the, yeah, yeah. the yeah. But it's like too constrained, and uh, we have to look at it, into this. Because I have the impression that uh, when when judges get the results, they just look at the at the last line, with it. like in a restaurant when you you have. So many people, and you have one, just one country. You look at the figure at the end, and you have feeling that is it reasonable or not? Because uh, they don't uh, imagine about the assessment procedures. The judge j doesn't understand how the guy got to that conclusion. He just has a feeling that is it too much? Is it? uh, it's like a black box for them. It is a serious. Issue. Greg is talking about one of three types of experts. Uh, for the plaintiff, for the dependent, and for the judge. And that, that's much more rare. And if you're only getting plaintiff and defendant, they're going to be outrageous. And the, this split the dis distance, I don't get it, is uh, understandable in a human sense. But, yeah. Yeah, that, that's supposed to be the system in Mexico. We have uh, experts on, for both sides and then the experts on the judge. And, and still the results are very, very bad. Yeah, I wanted to refer uh, to the study that you mentioned uh, by Saul Kozlovsky in Brazil. Uh, the way I look at this study is like a, a whole institution to avoid going to court. There's defenders, uh, and one of the main reasons is the delays of the court. But I also see uh, as a mechanism of negotiation, of seeking consensus rather than of ruling, which is different. It's part of the juridical system, but it's, it's acting as a mediator, I think. How, how does it fit with your analysis? Right. That would be part, would be part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the, 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 the conversation would be organized as a dialogue with the neo-constitutionalists, because I, I forgot to say that legal scholars in, in, in Latin America are becoming more important now because they are part of the public sphere, they are giving strong opinions. And they have this um, tendency to see these kind of situations as bad. <laughs> Don't use the law as a negotiating tool. That's a horrible thing. They have a normative point of view. And what I say is, let's see what happens in real world, I mean, probably it's, it's not so bad. Probably the outcomes are much better. Yeah. Because the idea is that these new uh, legal scholars, this emergent voice in the public space, want um, to have everything solved by the judge. Yeah. It's the wisdom of the judge that will illuminate everyone. And I think that the expectations about that are, are too too high, and I don't, I just but, but anyway, it, I don't want to answer to that position uh, with a normative, mm -hmm. my own normative view. I think we, what we have to do is some research to prove what the results are. And then we have the normative discussion. Mm -hmm.
Um, so in, in Brazil, uh, there have been some writings since the 1990s about how the political system is transitioning from a more clientelistic system to a, a more uh, citizenship oriented, uh, a more democratic system. Um, so uh, my question to you is whether the, the judicial intervention in, in urban governance is, is speeding up that process and, and what are the impacts on the poor? Who are the poor who have been previously enmeshed in clientelistic relationships, do they use the 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 just the, the judicial system to to achieve more democratic participation, or is it that they're left out because because they're illegal, they're squatters or whatever? Um, my second question is methodological, uh, in the sense that. There, there seems to be in the literature two ways of going about it. Either you focus on one case and look at both the courts and the, the social groups that are, that are uh, plaintiffs in the court, and, and, and you look at the history of the whole, whole case. And, and the second me methodology is to look at the court and to look at all cases of a specific type. And so say expropriation, so you, you look at a whole bunch of cases on expropriation versus just looking at one case. Where doing more research with the group that, that went to court. And I, I wanted to know whether you have a preference in that. Okay. Um, the, the first question, I, I do have the same question. <laughs> I, I, I'm curious about what, what's happening. And then you, you, you phrase it wonderfully. I mean, I, I share that, that question. The second point is, for a research program, I think we have to, to combine both. You can have your own personal preference to do one research or, or the other. I would do, I'm, I'm more prone to do the, the second one. Uh, but it is surprising that sometimes the literature is so uh, divided. Uh, there is this wonderful book I, I just came across last week here, thanks, of, because I'm so close to Harvard. I can, uh, a, a, a political scientist studying the media and judges in Mexico and the problem of non-compliance. Government not complying with judge rulings are how the court deals with this problem. And this man was using a, a beautiful database and making wonderful speculations about all the, these general trends. And this was happening in Mexico City from 2000 to 2005. He doesn't mention the case of Valentino. Mm -hmm. It's a political scientist who's ignoring the, the most important political conflict of his subject, which is not complying with the courts. So I, mean, that I imagine this, this researcher <coughs> sticking to his methods and to his uh, discipline, but not seeing the sheep <laughs> in front of him. And that's kind of so what I want, I think we, we should strive for is a nice combination of different methods. Even if, 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 if the risk is uh, eclecticism, I know, but I, I prefer to run that risk, uh, to run the risk of not seeing the, the ship in front of me. Thank you very much for very enlightening, and I know that we we are sort of a. Uh, overwhelmed with a uh, number of questions and issues that are still pending and, and issues that we uh, we ignore so much about um, and, and we don't know where how to uh, address these questions and, and uh, but um, before we finish I, um, I there is one thing about understanding of that some understanding how do they describing situations and but how do you think that we can make a difference with that from your research can you so uh, if you if you tomorrow okay now we have a better understanding what's next then where do you take this? Well, I think that there are policy implications very clear to to this kind of uh, research. But I think if we after the, the painful process of research and publishing yeah. complicated things, we have yeah. we have simple reports that, that that tell people not only anecdotes. Mm. Because anecdotes, you can find them in the, in the newspapers. Mm. You can contextualize in general trends. I think we can open the eyes of lawmakers, judges, and, and, and the public sphere. Can I, I think, think that, 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 that,
question that had been asked is whether you, you, you perceive that there is a trend in one, one direction or another there. Is there something that you can say, well, there is a trend and you can, from your research, basically ratify the existing of a trend that people could expect something of moving in, in a better in a direction mm -hmm. that is better or, or things are being more confused confusing than, than, than before. And, and you have some good cases of that showing that, in fact, there is some, some uh, many of these new legislation came with a lot of, of irresolution, with, sort of embedded in most of these legislations that have been passed, right? And, and that created more ground for confusion than actually advancement for people's right, or whatever you want to refer to. Mm -hmm. you, you, you want to, me to give a general term? Yes. Okay. So, well, I, I, would, I would put it, this way. And even if there are worrying things happening in the, in the, in the judiciary, yeah. like judges giving too much protection to property rights, the general context of courts being discussed in the public sphere mm -hmm. and, the, and the law being discussed in the public sphere is, 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 is a good news. And this is, this is the context that will allow us to correct. So the good news is that we are opening the, the black boxes now. Yes, that's, that's right. Yeah. That's something to take home with <laughs> Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you.